Welcome to the MCC module on exhibits. My name is Cameron Robinson, and I'll be leading today's training. Today we'll start off by talking about the role of exhibits in cases, then the kinds of exhibits you might face in a case interview. Third, we'll talk about how to analyze exhibits, and then we'll discuss three key tips to remember. Next, we'll move into two examples of exhibits. First, a quantitative question example, and second, an analytical question example. Lastly, we'll talk about how you can gain further practice on your own. The reason some case interviews include exhibits is so that firms can gauge your comfort level with data and data visualization. They also want to assess your hypothesis-driven problem-solving skills and conceptual thinking skills. When it comes to exhibits, there are lots of different types. The first key difference in the types of exhibits is between tables and charts. Tables are simply tables of data or information, whereas charts are visualized data. These are two simple, straightforward examples of each category type, but some exhibits that you might get on a case can be very challenging and complex, like this one. When you're faced with a difficult, complex exhibit, the first thing is to not freak out. Be sure to take however much time you need to understand the exhibit and ask whatever questions you need to. It's helpful to remember that not every consultancy relies the same amount on exhibits in their interviews. Big three firms are those who use exhibits the most, and, among, and amongst them, particularly BCG emphasizes exhibits throughout the case. Moving on to a second difference among exhibits is the difference between quantitative and analytical exhibits. This distinction, unlike the first one, has to do with the type of question that you're asked and not with the type of information that's presented to you, or rather, how it's presented to you. Quantitative questions require the candidate to perform calculations in analyzing the exhibit, whereas analytical exhibits, or sorry, analytical questions merely ask candidates to draw conclusions. Every time you analyze an exhibit, you should follow three simple steps. Step number one, ask questions. Make sure you understand what you're looking at. It's okay if you don't know what an acronym or a term means on the exhibit. It's also a good idea to ask for the why behind the numbers. Second of all, ask for time to review the exhibit, usually 30 to 60 seconds. During this time, come up with key insights and then create a structure and signpost them before you explain them to the interviewer. Step three, explain the key takeaways, always signposting your insights. When it comes to what to say, you should always say three things. First, what does the exhibit say? Second of all, what does that mean? And third of all, what insights or recommendations can we draw from that? There are three key tips to remember. As you can tell, we consultants love our threes. The first tip is to leave no stone unturned when analyzing an exhibit. Sometimes exhibits will have lots and lots of information on them. Be sure to take your time and be methodical and go through all the aspects of the exhibit that could hold key nuggets of information that could be the solution to solving the case. Second of all, quantify whatever you say. Instead of just saying X is a lot bigger than Y, say that it's 100% bigger. And third of all, relate your findings from one exhibit to any previous knowledge you have from the case, either from past exhibits, from past quant problems solved, or from past analytical questions. These three tips might be hard to implement in the examples that follow simply because these exhibits will not be shown within the context of a full case. And so, for example, it will be difficult for me to relate findings to previous knowledge from the case. Now let's move on to our first example. The example one is going to be a table exhibit, and it will require us to do some quantitative calculations. Here's the question. Given each plan's current level of profitability, what are the options and implications for each plan regarding whether to retain and improve operations or sell the plant? And here's the exhibit. Why don't you pause the video and take a look at this exhibit? It might be helpful to have some key background. For example, the company Tier 1 Co. is an auto parts supplier for the company AutoCo. Again, here's the question if you forgot. 
Given each plant's current level of profitability, what are the options and implications for each plant regarding whether to retain and improve operations or sell the plant? Since it's a complex question, the first thing I would do in a case is clarify the objective. For example, I would ask, so just to be sure, what I'm trying to do is determine the profitability of each plant and then based on its profitability, decide what options we can do with that plant and then what the implications are of those options. Is that correct? Once the interviewer has confirmed that those are our objectives, then I would ask for some time to look at the exhibit and ask any clarifying questions. For example, I do have one question about this exhibit. I want to know what FG inventory means. So I would ask my interviewer. The response would be that FG means finished goods. Or in other words, it's your inventory of goods that have been made but not been sold to customers yet. Now that I've had all my questions answered, I'm going to ask the interviewer for some time to look at the exhibit and determine my plan of attack. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is determine the profitability of each plant. I'm going to do that first, and then once I've determined each plant's profitability, I'm going to take a minute to determine what the implications are of those, of those profit levels. Let's start with plant one. To determine profitability, I'm going to take total revenue, which I can find by multiplying revenue times volume, and then subtract from that both the variable costs and fixed costs. Thankfully, it looks like both variable costs and fixed costs are in costs per part, which means that I can create a profit margin for each good and then multiply that by the volume, which will help me save time. So for plant one, we have our revenue per part of $14. Then from that, we would subtract our variable costs, which are $5 plus $4 plus $2, or $11 total. And then our fixed costs, which are $2. That gives us a total profit margin of $1 per part. Now, to find total profit in a given year, we just need to multiply the revenue per part, sorry, the profit per part, times the number of parts sold. And note that the number of parts sold is in thousands. And so the profit for plant one is not 15,000, but 15 million. Now I'm going to follow an identical process for the remaining plants two and three. After finishing our calculations, I found that plant one is profitable, making $15 million of profit per year. Plant number two is not profitable, losing $12 million per year. And plant three is not profitable either, losing approximately $18 million per year. Now I would ask the interviewer to give me some time to analyze what the options are for each plant and to look at the rest of our exhibit and to determine what the implications are of each option. Now I'm going to go plant by plant and talk about what the options are for each plant and what the implications of those options are for our client. The first plant is profitable, making $15 million a year. That means that our client can either choose to let this plant remain operational or they can sell the plant. The implications of either one of these, um, sorry, one key implication of these options is that the variable costs are currently above the industry standard. So, if the plant is going to be kept open, operational improvements will need to be made. Since the labor there is also unionized, that means there could be potential union labor related issues. Plant number two is not profitable, losing $12 million a year. That means that our client can either sell the plant or they can demolish the plant. Demolition is probable because this plant isn't even covering their variable costs. Additionally, the plant is located in Mexico, which could impact the sale. And while the sale could be favorable, sorry, um, 
One point that supports the possible sale is that the plant was recently improved in 2001, and it's also the smallest plant. So if it is sold, it wouldn't have a huge impact on production. Plant number three is not profitable either, losing $18 million a year, the most of any plant. The options for our client are to either sell the plant or to improve operations and to retain it. The key thing about plant three is that it's covering its variable costs. So the plant could quickly become profitable just by increasing volume. And they seem to have capacity since the plant has a lot of space, even though they're not producing that many finished goods. So I would wanna know why is it that plant three is so large, but is producing so few finished goods and how can we improve operations? It's important to note that plant three also has unionized labor. And so there could be other union labor related issues. One point that I'd make in general about all the plants is that costs for all plants across all cost categories are higher than the industry standard. So that can present a huge challenge if our client wants to sell any one of these plants. One option to address this is that they could upgrade the facility as part of the sale. Let's move on to our second example. This will be a chart and the question will be asked is analytical in nature. Here's the question. Deloitte conducted a customer experience survey to understand how A to Z.com, an online retailer, currently compares to key competitors across the customer lifecycle. The results are on this customer experience data sheet. What key trends do you see and what could be causing these trends? How could our client differentiate or improve themselves? And here's the exhibit. You might have noticed that the question was pretty complex with lots of different parts to it. So if you need to clarify the objective, make sure you do, because if you don't address one of those questions that your interviewer asked, then you will lose points. If I were being given this case, this is something like what I would write on my paper before explaining my answer to the interviewer. I would start by saying, the first question you asked is, a, is what are the key trends and causes of those trends? I have broken down key trends into three different categories, strengths, adequacies, and weaknesses. Strengths are the things that our client is doing really well. And the stage in which they're excelling is customer attraction. In fact, they're significant, they're, um, they are consistently doing better than the competition across all the different categories within customer attraction. One of the reasons for this could be their first time purchase coupon. The client's strong acquisition could be due to this immediate incentive for purchase. Where our client is adequate is in the middle stage with customer acquisition, but their biggest weaknesses tend to be in the later stages of the customer life cycle involving post-purchase service and loyalty efforts. That's a big problem because if a customer has just one frustrating experience with the brand or company, then customers may not return. And so the reason that our client may be lagging in these, in the later stages of the customer life cycle is simply a lack of focus, a lack of resources in those areas, or a lack of expertise. The second question that was asked was, how can our client differentiate or improve? To differentiate or improve, our client can either strengthen its weaknesses or strengthen its strengths. I would suggest that first we strengthen our weaknesses. And to do that, the client should focus on initiatives that engender loyalty and generate repeat business. Some of the ways they could do this is by following up with customers and making them feel special after a purchase. The client can do this by following up via phone or email after a customer makes a purchase on the, ship, on the site. Another thing our client could do is implement a tracking system that tracks what each customer purchases to get to know them and then provide personalized recommendations about other goods that they could buy on the site. They could also create a personalized web page for each customer as a landing page on the website. Again, to make the customer feel special and feel a personal connection with the client. Last of all, they can provide special perks for, uh, for repeating customers, such as repeat purchase coupons or offers, loyalty rewards on the website, or other perks. 
When deciding amongst these myriad opportunities for differentiating and improving our client across the customer life cycle, I would suggest that our client analyze each one of these options across three criteria. Number one, how much will it cost us to it differentiate or improve in that category? Number two, what's the overall impact going to be on the business? And number three, how much time is it going to take to implement? Now that we've concluded our two practices, now that we've concluded our two examples, let's talk about where you can go to get more practice. One of the best resources is company websites. For example, McKinsey.com, Bain.com, BCG.com, where they have practice cases, many of which have exhibits. You can also read articles that the consultancy publishes online, or look in newspapers such as the New York Times, Economist, Bloomberg, or any other publication that discusses um, what's going on in the business world. The last and probably best resource is doing cases with actual consultants. I found that cases with good exhibits are often the hardest ones to come by among BYU students. But sometimes consultants at these firms have cases with really challenging exhibits that will force you to stretch your skills and learn. Thank you.